you, everybody, and welcome to my talk. Uh, it's about time to take your medication or how to write a friendly reminder bot. So um, I also work at Google Yonder, so normally I'm uh, more like a data scientist guy. And uh, yeah, the last EuroPython in Berlin, I gave a talk about uh, how you can extend um, scikit-learn with your own estimator, so quite mathy stats talk. And there were about 15 people who thought, OK, so this year I try something different. And well, <laughs> okay, it's a little bit better at least. <laughs> so surely the question that you all have is why would anyone write chatbot? And there's a little story behind it. So a friend of mine um, was uh, diagnosed with uh, diabetes. So you surely all know diabetes. So you have to take insulin the whole time. And he said that, yeah, so there's two kinds of insulin. There's one you take before you eat something or while you eat something, and then there's the, the long-acting insulin. This is something you have to take at a sp specific um, time during the day. And he said that he's always like forgetting about this or taking it one hour too late or too early. And uh, of course, he sets alarm on his smartphone, but it would be really cool if someone would somehow remind him just like use a chat or call him or somehow remind him. And then the idea was born, okay, why why not uh, write a little bot um, that uses uh, Google Talk or um, Facebook or any kind of uh, chatting engine and reminds him to actually please take your long-acting insulin now and to also wait for an answer that he really did it and otherwise like remind him again and all over. And I thought, well, that's also good for me. It's not only that I'm like helping a friend, it's also for me good because it's, um, it's a good use case to actually start um, learning something new, learning more about event-driven asynchronous programming, something where there's, there's a real hype right now. I mean, everyone's talking about AsyncIO. There were a lot of, a lot of uh, talks about AsyncIO. I don't know if you have you seen the talk by uh, Niklas about uh, the distributed hash table, which was a I think a really great talk about async IO. So I took this as like, yeah, a use case. I want to learn something about it. Also a little bit about XMPP and about how one can write a, like a, a Google app because in the end I used um, Google Hangouts to actually implement it. And of course, yeah, to help a friend. So, so the, the, the first thing I want to talk about is what is event-driven programming? Um, and what, it's, what, it, what it has to do with asynchronous programming. So event-driven programming, this is a definition of uh, Jessica McKellar from the, the Twisted Network Programming Essentials. In an event-driven program, program flows is determined by external events. It is characterized by an event loop and the use of callback to trigger action when events happen. So this is basically the definition and it just stated by any kind of event. An event could be like a user triggers an action or a message is received over a network. And then you have predefined actions, the so-called callbacks, that are then triggered and that actually um, do something. And in most cases, this is implemented as a kind of event loop, as a, as a main loop that listens for events, then triggers the callbacks. And callbacks are just continuation, so it's just like, what do I do if I uh, get a message or if I have received something? And um, event-driven programs can be single-threaded, but also multi-threaded architecture exists. So due to the, the, the gill in Python, so um, async IO is mostly uh, is single-threaded, but you could also imagine that you had for each uh, callback, you could start a new, um, you, a new thread or something, then you would have a more like a multi-threaded event-driven program, but this is mostly not, it's not what it's uh, done in most implementations. And um, to differentiate this a little bit from what is blocking and non-blocking, you could think of um, an event-driven program itself sort of purely from the definition could be blocking or could be non-blocking. That means, for instance, if you, if you have a GUI and you click on a, on, a, on a button, then an event is triggered, some action is gonna processed, and during that action, your whole GUI could be blocking. I mean, this is sometimes things you see um, on Windows, for instance, that the whole GUI blocks and is unresponsive, or uh, while evaluating th um, this callback, could be non-blocking so that other things can happen at the same time. 
or for instance, uh, another example would be some kind of 3D computer game. I mean, while the, the engine is waiting for user input, it's still calculating the physics engine and is updating the graphics. So what is asynchronous programming then? Asynchronous I.O. or non-blocking I.O. is a form of input-output processing that permits other processing to continue before the transmission has finished. So this is um, also a bit like like uh, a form of cooperative multitasking because you you kind of at certain points in, in during your execution you kind of give away the the processor to other things and to let it uh, yeah to you give it away so other tasks can use your uh, can use the processor so but it's it's cooperative uh, in contrast to preemptive in the sense that it's really at specific points and we will see that later and the concept can also be implemented as an event loop so since um, a picture says more than uh, 1000 words so <laughs> i'll um, have this graphic so if we have a program something a really simple program that basically consists of three tasks and the tasks um, have different colors. And if you see um, the gray boxes are actually like waiting times. This is when the, the task reads in a file or maybe waits for a network socket or message or an event by the, by, of the user. Then it kind of uh, is, it suspends its work, it, it waits. And the total uh, time is then of the, of the program is the sum of all those blocks. So in multi-threaded, you would like conically put each task in own thread and um, execute them in parallel. So this is something um, you would not do like this in, in Python. Python you would more or less use uh, processes because of the, of the global interpreter lock. But um, in this case, it's not important. Um, the point here is that you still have the gray blocks and the tasks are still waiting um, until, yeah, until some, some I.O. is ready, for instance. And in asynchronous, there it is that you have only one thread again, but during the gray blocks, there's actually a switch to another task and something is done. So here we start with the blue, then during the waiting time here, we start working on task number two and even on task number one, since you also we have a, a task number three, because here we also have a waiting block. And then it's in a concurrent way and in a way that can't be like really deterministic told. So it could, the, 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 the colors could also change on the right side. And I think this is, this is um, an important point. So concurrent uh, event driven programming, you don't know beforehand what the path uh, the threat through your program is going to be. So when to actually use asynchronous event driven programming, if you have many tasks, of course, you should have at least two, otherwise uh, it makes no really sense. If um, the, the tasks are largely independent, so there's, if there's no much intercommunication between two tasks, you could imagine if two tasks are the whole time talking to each other, then this could be um, difficult. Then, of course, when, you're, when your tasks wait for I.O., when they normally would block and you think you could do during that time, you could do other things. And um, if your tasks share a lot of mutable data that would, would be need to, to be synced if you do it in a multi-threaded or multi-processing way, this is also um, like an indicator that you could think about using something asynchronous or something event-driven. And this is especially for network application and user interfaces. Say, uh, interfaces. This is like uh, naturally that uh, you have, uh, you use asynchronous event-driven programming. So some examples I wanna show to, um, to better get the idea. So um, easy, easy tasks, such, uh, just fetch some URLs and uh, print them and check the elapsed time. So how would this look like in a single thread version? So we have uh, some, some hosts, just a list. We set our timer and for each host, we use the URL lib to request the host. 
and then we print it. We also do a little transformation to make it a little bit more uh, interesting. We just make everything uppercase and print the first 20 characters and the host where we got the, the web page from and print the elapsed time. So this would be um, like a normal thing, a threaded program uh, in Python, how you would um, do it. And uh, of course, what here is like the blocking. So here is actually the gray block that we've seen before in our diagram because we are waiting here for the request to be fulfilled and um, we wait for getting um, the, the request. And also here we wait to like read the HTML. So now let's do this in a multi-threaded way. Here it gets a little, only a, bit, a little bit more complicated. So we also do um, just the request um, and the reading in, in one uh, function. And now we generate some, some threads. So each task is just now a thread and it's uh, listed in, um, in the jobs list. And we start here with, the, with uh, our timer. So I skip the overhead of, of uh, creating the tasks, the threads. Then for each job we start it, we wait until they're joined, so until they're finished, and we see that there's a, there was a speed up. So this is um, just more or less a direct trans, uh, translation of the single-threaded program in a multi-threaded program. So how would this look like in an asynchronous style? And I used here Twisted, which is right now only available for uh, Python 2, but um, they are just working on a migration to Python 3. So here it gets a bit more complicated because we kind of have to separate the different parts of the program much more and we use now uh, callbacks. So we have here the capitalized function. So okay, we just use capitalize and uh, the strip it down to tw 20 characters um, and we print the elapsed time. And now here it's the interesting part. So for East host in our host list, we get the page and this is, non a, this is now a non-blocking operation. So this will directly return and will get us a deferred result. And a deferred result is, um, is what in, in Python async I always call the future. So it's, a, it's actually just a proxy for a future result and you can say what should happen if the result is retrieved. And this is what you do with the add callback. So you say, if I have a diff if the if the deferred result ever um, becomes the real result, then please print uh, call the print capitalized function with it, and this is yeah. So we registered our callback. So we and then we add everything to the list, and then we say okay. Um, now for all lists, if they are all um, if all deferred results actually fired, then we also want to fire the print elapsed time function and we call it with a task react, the main function. So this is now the event loop, so to say. So we say, okay, run this uh, loop and uh, run the, the, the function. And we see, yeah, that it, that it worked. But what you can see from this example is it gets really complicated. So adding the callbacks, it's like you have to think, okay, I have deferred result and I add callbacks. And if those fired, I group them and add another one. So it gets really complicated. And this is also a statement that Guido van Rossum uh, supposedly once said, so I find, found it on the net, this quote, and the net never lies, right? So it requires superhuman discipline to write readable code in callbacks, and if you don't believe me, look at any piece of JavaScript code. And um, so the question is, how would this now look if you would, for instance, use uh, async I.O.? So, um, in async IO, you would use a, a, a coroutine. So coroutine, um, so how many of you know what a coroutine is? So, okay, I would say most. So it's just a function where you can, like, it's not a function, a coroutine is like a more general idea of a function, but you can stop at one point, return, and, and come back. And um, here, I use the AIO HTTP, which is based on async IO, and at that point, we yield from the request and um, so we give away the execution here for other tasks to do something at the waiting time, but what we get in return is, is the, the real response. So um, if the, the function here, uh, so you yield from, if the function um, after yield from uh, returns a future, you wait until the future gets uh, like realized um, 
or if it's a coroutine until the next um, result is generated. And um, then we yield from the response and read and we directly get the HTML and um, now for each in host, in host, we have a task list again, we append this uh, print page function, we get the event loop and we run the task until they're done and we also see um, the speed up. So this, the, uh, the point here is that um, using async IO and avoiding callbacks uh, in this example, it's uh, much more readable and it much more looks like the, the single threaded version actually. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it avoids this complicated graphs of, of, of callbacks. So I think this uh, gets you like a, a good idea about asynchronous event-driven programming. So um, now back to our actual task. So how to build now a bot based on this. So the idea is we uh, notify a friend at 8 p.m. as agreed about taking his long acting insulin using Google Talks or Google Hangout. Then we wait 20 minutes for reply. Then we ask again, did you really take it? And ask again after another time. We, the, during the whole time we check if there's a message which uh, starts or is equal to yes. If we get this message, we praise him, we say yeah, well done, good job. And if the message is, um, is any other to, uh, to yes, we, we just say, uh, we just ignore it. Of course, we could also send uh, something like I, I didn't get it or so. Yeah, and after having three ti uh, times asked in total, we want to send a give up message like, okay, now I'm giving up uh, and uh, ask again tomorrow. So when, when actually um, stating something like this, it's, for me at least, it was helpful to come up first with the, with the state graph because what we are actually doing with the abstraction is that we are changing between different states and there are also libraries for this in, in Python. Um, but bef before, before I build it, I just wanted to know, okay, so how many states do I actually have to make it, uh, yeah, to make the, the solution as simple as possible. So when during the, during the day we are in a, in a no message send state, so this is the initial state, and what happens if we, for instance, get any kind of message, so this is the event from uh, my buddy, from a friend um, at that time, then we just do nothing. So to avoid things that he, for instance, writes yes before I even have asked. I mean, this is a situation to consider. And uh, at, so at the event at 8 p.m., we send a message. We are now in the message send state. So if he replies then with a yes, we send, okay, that's good, send the praise, and go back. After another 20 minutes, we ask again. And I think you get the idea. Um, until that point, and there is also, if he then repeats with uh, yes, it's still okay, but after one hour we send, okay, you've done not so good, and um, we give up. And this is um, how it can be um, translated in a program. But which uh, protocols are actually used? So first I thought about, um, or I started to implement it in XMPP. So XMPP is the extensible message and presence protocol which is based on XML. It, or formerly it was known uh, uh, as Chubber. And uh, the Google Talk, so Gtalk used it, but um, it was uh, deprecated quite lately. So Google switched to, to Hangout, which is a proprietary protocol, which is, uh, yeah, not that good. Even Facebook, um, they had an XMPP AP until just uh, recently, May uh, 2015, where they, where they stopped it. So this is uh, not so good, but still, uh, Gtalk is, uh, is working. And um, I also did an implementation for this. And um, so um, if you wanna ever do something with XMPP, I would recommend the Sleek XMPP library and you also get a lot of good documentation about it. But since it was uh, deprecated, um, I switched to, to Google Hangouts, as I said, a proprietary pr protocol, and a really good library that was this uh, kind of, uh, is, is a reverse engineering of um, Google Hangouts is Hangups by Tom Dreyer. And um, yeah, it's a quite active project at the moment, and it also already provides 
um, a chat client, uh, interactive chat client, and there's a lot of bots already based on, on Hangup. So this is a really interesting project. So the implementations, the two, are, can be found on um, the Blue Yonder website. Um, not Blue Yonder website, but the Blue Yonder group GitHub account. And I wanna sh just, so, sh just show some um, code examples. So where it all starts is like the, the, the run um, of the, the bot class. So it's really not that much code actually, so you can later uh, just look it up. But so the interesting part is um, that you, that so client is now the, the hang up protocol client and you say uh, what should happen on a connect, you connect different, uh, to, you connect different functions to the events that are then called, so this is the observer pattern. And uh, we have here the, the event loop. We get the seconds to the next alarm, so it's just the, yeah, the function that calculates from now to uh, next 8 p.m. today or tomorrow, and um, says later I'm gonna call the function set alarm, and then it's like calling the, the connect function of the, of the client to do some more rest, 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 registering of um, callbacks. So how does the set alarm function uh, look like? It's a little bit more interesting. So here's the message. Um, we get the, the conversation with the recipient. So because, I mean, you could chat to, 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 to many people at the same time. We yield from the message. So this is also, again, a point where we give away the execution to do something others, like waiting for an answer or um, for doing other kind of uh, network um, transmissions. We set here the state that we are now in the, in the ask state. We sleep, and since we yield from async IO sleep, here it's also, we give away the execution to other tasks that can be uh, ran concurrently. And here it's just this three times um, asking, and here is the, the giving up question, uh, the giving up. And in the end, we just set the, the timer, set it back to the next time. And it, it's, I think the, the, the code is like quite easily readable and it um, avoids, um, it more or less avoids the, the registering a lot of callbacks on some kind of deferred results like you would have done it maybe uh, with Twisted. And uh, now handling a message, so on events when the message is received, we get from the message the converse conversation, we get the user ID, we get the, the text, what was actually sent. Uh, we check if the user ID is um, equal to the same, uh, to the recipient ID, to the one we want to talk. We check if the text is, is positive, a positive answer. And if everything is fulfilled, we are in the right state, it is positive, and it's from, from uh, our body, we just send the message, that's great, and go back in the, in the, in the false, in the asked equals false state. So we go back to the initial state in our state diagram. All right, that's much about the, the source code. As I said, you can just check it up online. Um, maybe one more thing. Um, about the authorization, if you write a bot like this, you don't want to like provide your credentials and put it somewhere uh, in a file. So this is where the all authentication do standards comes um, into play. And this allows um, that you as a resource owner um, give, to a special, give special rights to, um, to your application. So, and it works by using user tokens. So how does this work? Your application, all it wants to do is to use your Google account to actually send some messages and it doesn't need to know all your contact, contacts, it's just sending messages. So it requests a token with a scope of sending um, messages. Then the, you get a URL, this is, uh, you can display to the user. This is then basically, you all know this kind of screens where you then just click accept and um, you get the authorization code back and you can use this code to get um, a token. And um, with this token, your application can then, without knowing your password um, of your Google account, um, use the Google API to work, um, yeah, to, to, to send messages over hangups or, yeah, 
Google Talk. All right, um, so just a picture to show how it looks like uh, in the end. And uh, yeah, it's just an easy, easy use case, but it worked in the end and he's quite happy with it. Um, thanks to Tom Dreyer, so this was the, the guy uh, from Hangups um, who also uh, helped me a bit. And yeah, all the pictures I took are Creative Commons. And thank you for your attention. And yeah. So, hi, thanks for your talk. Um, I actually have two small questions. Like, uh, have you thought of implementing this on other communication supports, like, for example, Telegram, WhatsApp, all this kind of stuff? What? Sorry. Um, have you thought of other um, communication supports apart from Hangouts? like WhatsApp, Facebook, uh, Telegram, are you implementing it? And the other question is, I actually thought of making something like this, uh, having a chronic disease myself to force to just remember stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but what I thought would be really interesting in this would be to have some kind of AI or machine learning to actually, um, for having the computer knowing when I'm more keen to forget to take it or this kind of stuff. So. Is it some kind of idea you have in the future? Because I would be really yeah. interested in participating then. Yeah, I, I also thought about this because I mean now I now get the messages so when he took it and maybe over the weekend he, um, he f it's more easy to forget, right? I mean maybe you're in a party or whatever and it's not just not the right time and you're like, you don't do anything. And um, of course you could then run a lot of statistical analysis on it. And I mean, since uh, I work as a data scientist, of course if you would have a lot of information about this, you could do some statistics. You could even predict that on a weekend. Um, yeah, but on the other hand, it's always with private information, right? Because, um, yeah, but I think this is a, is a good idea, and um, I think the, the, the basic ideas so your, to your first question could also be easily um, done on, on Facebook. And so there are a lot of libraries if you start looking for it, and there are also a lot of, of bot libraries um, that could help with uh, um, finding the right answers or making maybe the conversation a lot more interesting. So there are, there's stuff like this. I wanted to keep it f simple as a first try, but yeah, now one could could definitely uh, build on it. Yeah. More questions? Hi. Um, yeah, that, that's really great. Have you thought of putting any kind of link back to um, maybe something physical like opening a packet or so that you both have proof as well as his uh, yes command that he has taken this insulin? Excuse me, like so, so say um, he had to open a packet that moved a switch and that was recorded that he had. I, I'm more thinking about, um, say, people with Alzheimer's who need to be reminded to take tablets. Have you thought of expanding it in that kind of way? So far, not, not really, but so I, so it's still... So, it, I mean, in the um, in, uh, physio world, they, uh, they're really keen on making sure that people do actually take their tablets as opposed to just saying, yes, they've taken them. So have you thought of expanding it so that you can have a switch that saw that someone had opened a pill box, say? Ah, okay, that, now I understand, yeah. I mean, then it gets, of course, more complicated. You would need to have the device or what those insulin pumps, for instance, um, some already have some yeah, technique in it. And one, if one could access that protocol and then you could maybe even, uh, um, yeah, he could connect his smartphone to that device. I, I know that um, there's a lot going on. For instance, the, the measurement of the blood sugar is now um, just like three months ago, there was a new device from, from Libre, which is constantly like measuring your blood sugar. You have it on your, on your right um, arm and um, you can just read it out and uh, on a, on a, a second by second basis, which is much better than doing it the conventional way. And of course one could like 
trigger back. So if he took it, then you will also get from this sensor that uh, the blood sugar goes down. And so uh, there's uh, endless possibilities, but this would, uh, then I would need to like, I mean, this would not, was not a commercial idea or something, it was just for me a use case, but I think it's definitely possible in a technical sense and one could follow up on that, yeah, definitely. More questions? Right, um, that was fascinating. Thank you very much again, Brian. Thank you.